Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for making it here so early this morning to join our distinguished lecture forum. Let me tell you first that uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Uh, uh, Danny Leipziger, who used to be one of our uh, colleagues at the at World Bank. Uh, I believe many of you are already very familiar with his name and face because uh, he was here with us uh, last year to give an excellent speech on China. Uh, he is currently a professor of international business at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Before joining the uh, Washington University, he used to work. He used to, to work at the World Bank. He spent, I think, uh, almost his uh, career there. I just I was told that he worked for the bank for 28 years, and he spent the last five years there as vice president uh, between 2004 and 2009, right? right? And so he is going to give us a talk today on a very interesting issue, namely globalization and multilateralism. These two words are very important because they have, uh, have been major contributing factors, factors to the uh, global economic prosperity that we have had during the uh, post-war period. Uh, but uh, globalization and multilateralism seem to be at the crossroad at the moment in many respects. Uh, in many countries, we hear these days that voices of anti-globalization is getting bigger and louder, especially in advanced economies, stricken by the uh, slow economic growth. And it is irony that, uh, that uh, globalization actually was promoted by the advanced economies in the past. But these days, uh, emerging economies are very cautious about these uh, moving this globalization forward. At the same time, the multilateralism is also in difficulty. The uh, WTO Doha round uh, shows no sign that uh, it will be revived and concluded anytime soon, despite repeated urgings made by the uh, G20 summits. So both of these uh, were now in difficulties. And uh, I think there are three major questions to be asked and answered. One is the, uh, what are the major factors behind this uh, uh, such uh, globalization? and stagnant multilateralism. And what are the prospects for this globalization and multilateralism uh, as uh, the economic gravity shifts very rapidly from uh, advanced economies to uh, emerging economies? Finally, what the G20 can do possibly about it? And I think these are all two tall questions to be answered. But I believe uh, Dr. Uh, Danny Leipziger is the right person to address these issues since he has, I shouldn't say enough, but uh, quite a lot of experiences, uh, research experiences, uh, 
at the bank and elsewhere. You may remember that uh, he wrote an excellent book last year. The title of the book is Globalization and Growth, which was written jointly with uh, Professor Michael Spence, a Nobel laureate from Harvard University. And another interest, interesting book is due to publish this year. The title of the book is Ascent After Decline, Challenges of Growth in a Post-Crisis World. And that has, those two books are, may have to do a lot with uh, the today's topic he's going to speak. And besides that, he has an ample research experience uh, at the World Bank for so many years. Uh, I remember one, even on Korea. Uh, the title of the report was uh, Korea uh, Transition to Maturity, which was written in the mid-1980s. Uh, I found that uh, the report was one of the most read among the bank staffs at the time around. So, uh, I can hardly wait his talk, and uh, now let me present him to, to you, and please join me in welcoming him. Well, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Nam, for such a gracious uh, introduction. Uh, I want to assure you that despite all the things that Dr. Nam said I did, I'm still only 35 years old. Um, so uh, I picked uh, a rather large topic uh, for this morning, uh, but I think as Dr. Nam said, uh, we are in a very precarious uh, position uh, in terms of globalization and uh, multilateralism, and I want to explore some of those uh, aspects uh, with you um, uh, this morning. Um, so let me again thank the Institute for Global Economics, um, uh, one of my biggest fans uh, in Korea, uh, starting uh, with uh, Dr. Sagong and uh, Dr. Na. So uh, the types of topics that I want to try to cover uh, briefly this morning uh, include the following. Uh, first, that there is a discernible shift in economic power going on. Uh, I think this is uh, well documented. Uh, we don't exactly know the rate of ascent of uh, uh, China's economy for the next 20 or 30 years, uh, but we certainly know what's happened over the last uh, 10. Uh, and we know that there are other economies, including Korea, that have taken up a much larger role uh, in the international uh, uh, economic power uh, structure. At the same time, this has been reinforced by the recent uh, economic collapse globally and the fact that the recovery has been driven uh, not by the advanced economies uh, but by the emerging market economies. And in fact, the emerging markets, the new economic powers as I like to call them, provided a cushioning effect to the downside of the crisis. It would have been a lot worse uh, without that. But coming out of the crisis, uh, many of the advanced economies have fiscal problems. And the US is one of them. Japan obviously has had one uh, fiscal problem for a long time. Uh, and a number of countries in Europe, um, as I will mention as well. So there's this fiscal drag. And uh, this does not bode well for uh, some future growth rates. And a number of the advanced economies are well below their potential growth rate, you know, the calculation that the, uh, the IMF uh, is famous for. The third factor that's changing on the international landscape is views on capital flows, right? Uh, starting, I think, with a rather provocative paper by Subramanian and Danny Roderick. Uh, there's been a questioning as to whether or not countries should be as open to capital flows in the future as they were in the past. <clears throat> and to that we now have uh, a, bit, a change of position, <clears throat> particularly in the IMF, about uh, what countries should do 
in the face of large capital inflows, whether or not they should um, try to deter them or not. The fourth aspect of this changing landscape has to do with trade, and Dr. Nam alluded to the Doha round. I'll say a few things about that. The irony is that the biggest driver of world trade these days is South-South trade. And a lot of uh, the arrangements, whether they're FTAs or others, uh, are in a sense outside of the Doha uh, process. Uh, and so we have a bit of a disconnect between where the large increases in trade are coming from and where the political uh, debate is. Then we have a conversation which has to do with the drivers of growth. So uh, this uh, book that I did with Mike Spence was part of a process uh, of, of work uh, that was called uh, the Growth Commission, which between 2004 and 2008, we had a panel of 20 world-class experts, including Mike Spence and Bob Solo, but also Han Duk Su and uh, ex-president Zedillo of Mexico and Monte Carlo Alia and a num number of people on this growth commission and we came out with a report in 2008 which basically reinforced a lot of the messages coming out of East Asia which is that you need certain ingredients to growth the recipes may differ that was the analogy of Bob Solo uh, but you need certain ingredients <clears throat> the question coming out of this recession was whether or not these views on what were the drivers of growth uh, were changing. And uh, I may say a word or two about uh, the, um, the other topic um, that is hot has to do with convergence and divergence. So uh, a lot of effort is spent on looking at the convergence part, which is essentially that as countries mature, their growth rates tend to uh, decline. It's sort of a uh, diminishing marginal return kind of concept. Um, but the interesting, or the, in this case, uh, challenging thing in the context of multilateralism is that a lot of this convergence between countries is also being accompanied by divergence inside economies, which means that the distribution of income is getting worse or more, more uneven in a lot of countries and that this creates some challenges to multilateralism. And then the obvious question is, what is the uh, future uh, role of China? So uh, this is sort of the, the general landscape of what I'd like to uh, cover uh, this morning in, a, in an abbreviated uh, fashion. So let's start with the US. <clears throat> well, the reality is that neither the stimulus package nor QE2, uh, which is not a boat, obviously, um, but quantitative easing, uh, was really able uh, to propel the U.S. out of its uh, recession. It took some change in confidence, and ironically, this change of confidence was triggered by an extension of tax cuts uh, for the wealthy. Not exactly what you would expect, uh, but neither fiscal policy nor monetary policy was really uh, doing the trick. One of the reasons for this lack of confidence in the business sector and in households was that the unemployment rate was extremely high and continues to be very high in the U.S. And two-thirds of households in the U.S. saw their net worth decline between 2007 and 2009. And the middle class is the one that was hit the most. So there was a, a severe shock uh, to the system. At the same time, and following up on this divergence point, the income distribution in the U.S. has gotten much more uneven. And I'll show you a picture in a moment uh, that shows how uneven that has become. Going forward, President Obama in his State of the Union uh, speech a few months back said that the three factors that the U.S. needed to focus on were infrastructure, education, and innovation. So for those that are the economists in the group, uh, that's basically the elements of the production function, capital, labor, and technology. Um, so I think he was quite right. Uh, the U.S. has done poorly in terms of education. 
much worse than Korea on the PISA test, for example. We have very high uh, indebtedness now, GDP, uh, debt to GDP ratio approaching 100%. And we have a lot of liquidity in the system based on the actions of the Fed, which now need to be reversed. And the reversal of soaking up this liquidity <clears throat> can only have one impact on uh, interest rates, and that is to uh, move them up. So the U.S. has some difficulty in trying to find the right combination of instruments to get growth going again. And at the same time, as I said, unemployment is unacceptably high. The picture that I want you to keep in your mind is what proportion of national income in the U.S. is captured by the top 1% of the population. And as the picture shows, not since 1928, unfortunately the year before the Great uh, Depression, was the distribution of income in the U.S. as uneven, according to this measure, as it was in 2007, which was before the crisis. So the top 1% of families captured 23.5% of national income. So almost a quarter to the top 1%. And if you compare it to 1978, it was about 9%. So you have a tremendously increasing inequality in terms of distribution of income, which has implications for multilateralism, as I will mention uh, as we go forward. Well, the story in Europe, uh, pretty clear that Europe is paying dearly for overexpanding the Eurozone, for lax fiscal oversight, and for what's inherent in parts of the Eurozone, which is a fixed exchange rate. Anybody reading the Financial Times will see that almost all commentators come to the same conclusion, which is that the current uh, arrangement, particularly for Greece, uh, but also for a few of the other countries, of not dealing with uh, their highly indebted state um, is very costly uh, to Europe. I personally think that debt restructuring is the correct answer. Uh, I think it's the correct answer for two reasons. One, Europe is going to have to spend a lot of money, as will the IMF, uh, trying to uh, deal with imbalances uh, in the southern part of Europe. And in the end, they're not going to work because imagine you're the Minister of Finance of Greece, right? What are your instruments? Your deficit is 10% of GDP or more and you have to be fiscally contracting, right? Monetary policy is determined in Frankfurt. Exchange rate is fixed. You have no instruments. How can you possibly grow out of this uh, deficit? So I believe that the risks of confidence being diminished in the Eurozone <clears throat> are much lower than the risks of continuing to keep countries in a low growth position. So I believe that uh, in Europe, uh, Germany's surplus needs to come down. It's essentially analogous to the German versus um, other parts of the EU zone. Imbalance is sort of like the US and China, right? You have one that's unsustainably in surplus, another it's unsustainably in deficit. So I think that the future growth path uh, depends very much on uh, how long the EU is willing to continue uh, trying to avoid what we might call the inevitable. Well, the China story. China's growth rates have been remarkable, and uh, we'll look at that in a minute. But the question is, uh, is the multilateral system really ready to be managed by the G2? And my answer to that is no. Um, it is true, however, that if you consider China's economy of, let's say, five trillion, not on a purchasing power basis, just straight GNP accounting, five trillion, when a, an economy at, of five trillion grows at 10% a year, that's an increment of 500 billion per year. 500 billion is larger than the GNPs of at least 120 countries of the world. And we're not talking about small island states. We're talking about Costa Rica, Peru, Senegal, you name it. Uh, there are more than 100 countries whose GNP is smaller than the increment to China's economy uh, every year. 
That said, <clears throat> there is a certain, what I call, precociousness to growth, uh, which means that I don't think that China is quite ready yet to exercise all of the responsibilities that come with the size of the economy that it has. So the analogy I like to use is uh, something similar to the wealthy teenager. Um, <clears throat> so if you walk around Myeongdong uh, and you see the wealthy teenagers, uh, uh, they have the money, maybe from their parents, uh, they have the money but they may not have the responsibility. And um, I think China in a way fits uh, that uh, characterization. The whole role of China may be part of what Mohammed El Aryan refers to as the new normal, which is that uh, coming out of this recession, there already were a number of factors that were changing the international landscape, but the recession and the aftermath of it have accentuated uh, that to the point where we're not going back to the status quo ante. It's not just a normal business cycle where you go back to where you were before. There are a number of fundamental changes that El Arian puts into his description of the new normal, which is a lot less reliance on uh, flows of capital, much higher levels of indebtedness, uh, greater stresses on trade, and different sources of, of growth going forward. <clears throat> But coming back to China, uh, everyone focuses on the exchange rate. Um, I would say that's only one of the many areas uh, where jobs and exports are being promoted. I'm not saying this is a bad policy, but it does have implications for the multilateral system which need to be uh, looked at. And the G20 so far has not been able to uh, really definitively do what the IMF was unable to do in the previous five years, which was to make some policy judgments on unsustainable imbalances and exchange rates and have governments take those seriously. So this is an attempt, it's not exactly um, artistically correct, but it is close, uh, which shows over the last 10 years what's happened to China's uh, uh, economic uh, potential or GNP versus the US. On the vertical is growth rates, so China's up there at, you know, 9, 10%, and the U.S. is at its normal rate of about 2 to 2.5, which has been the growth rate of the United States for 100 years on average. Um, but China is moving from the red circle to the blue over this 10-year period, and the U.S. shrinking a bit uh, in relative weights in the global economy, okay? In terms of the art, China should be a little smaller and the U.S. a little larger because the U.S. is almost a 15 trillion economy still and China's five, so it should be uh, basically one to three. <clears throat> but there's no doubt that the distribution of economic power is uh, shifting. Now, in the near term, I just threw this in because uh, there's a lot of question about the inflation rate in China, and I don't claim uh, to, to have the answer, but it's instructive to look at the red line, which is M2, and see that over the last decade, uh, the supply of money defined as M2 has gone up about eightfold in China. So you don't have to believe in the quantity theory of money, but if growth was 10% a year for a decade, it goes up by 100%. Uh, money supply went up by 800%. So make whatever assumption you like about the velocity of money, prices uh, have to go up. So there's been a fair amount of repressed inflation in China, and I think uh, we're now seeing some of that coming, uh, coming to the fore. Well, one should say a few things about the uh, other BRICS, <clears throat> which is a category that has become popular, although there are some tremendous differences among the BRICS, uh, which make them uh, interesting as a conglomerate of countries, but uh, quite different. So Brazil has uh, attracted a lot of attention recently, in part because of its view that it didn't want its appreciation, it didn't want its exchange rate to appreciate, uh, and was willing to do something about it. Um, so for those of you who 
follow capital flows in the past, you know that there was a big debate inside the IMF and other places about whether or not countries should be deterring certain types of capital. In particular, Chile put a capital import tax on in the 80s. And they were roundly criticized for this. But now Brazil has put successively higher import taxes, 2, 4, 6 um, percent, in, in an attempt to keep the exchange rate from appreciating. At the same time, uh, they have very high internal debt, which means very high interest rates to begin with. So it's, in a way, you could say it's a bit of a losing battle, because if you think that Brazil's prospects are good and you want to invest in Brazil, uh, you're going to get high returns in any event, and then you think the exchange rate is going to move in your favor. So um, it's not clear that they're able to keep these um, flows out. But um, Brazil has a lot of natural resources and uh, is doing well because of commodity prices and China's demand. Uh, but there's a lot of internal debate about you know, what, is, what should be the industrial policy, quote unquote, uh, for Brazil um, uh, going forward. If we look at India, very high uh, fiscal deficit, uh, some real limitations uh, based on poverty, poor governance, the local level in particular, and internal infrastructure constraints, but a huge market. Um, so, you know, India is up and coming, but uh, no one quite expects it to take the path that China uh, took. South Africa perhaps doesn't belong in the BRICS, um, but it sounds better to be BRICS than BRIC, um, because South Africa has a lot of uh, economic and social problems, very high energy intensity, carbon intensity, some uh, very high unemployment rates, and as an economy is not huge. I mean, it is large uh, in Africa, but it's, it's not a, it's not a, a huge uh, global player. And the, the final um, country that's in the BRICS and also in the G8 rather than G7 is Russia. Uh, I personally find that Russia resembles pretty much a resource-rich economy with relatively poor governance. Um, and may not, uh, may not merit being in the, the elite uh, group of the, um, of the G8 based on uh, rule of law and other uh, issues. So just pictorially, if we look at the G7 roughly today or a few years ago compared to 2030, and taking estimates from the IMF and OECD and other places, uh, we can see the G7 uh, declining in their share of global GDP from roughly 60 to 40 or so percent. Um, and the new economic powers in which I include Korea uh, and the BRICS and Indonesia and a few others, uh, those 10 economies um, will be growing uh, dramatically. And the question is, how do you preserve the important aspects of multilateralism when you have this big shift in economic uh, power. At the same time, we have some uh, major threats to globalization, and uh, Dr. Nam uh, started alluding to those. Uh, we know that the trade regime is uh, essentially uh, broken. Um, the good news is that tariffs are pretty low around the world. Um, the bad news is that Doha got stuck on issues that are yesterday's issues rather than tomorrow's issues. It got stuck uh, on things that did not have to do with services, for example, which is the highly uh, growing part of, uh, of world trade. So in a way, Doha has become relatively less important substantively, although it is very important uh, symbolically. And some people have said, well, the WTO should become a dispute settlement mechanism and forget about the round because that's been going on for too long. The difficulty with these rounds is that there was always a battle inside every government dealing with trade negotiations, uh, contrasting essentially the winners and the losers. And there was always enough in the winning column in terms of new gains from trade to make up for some of the uh, uh, losing um, aspects.
The trouble is, with tariff rates being very low now and trade being fairly free, these gains to trade have, have emerged with or without the Doha round. And so the additional benefits of Doha are seen uh, to be relatively small uh, compared to some of the commitments that countries have to make. Another threat to globalization has to do with what you do about capital flows. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, Tobin taxes and other uh, impediments to capital flows. I believe in strong regulation, but I don't believe in, in taxing them. I don't think it deals with the fundamental problem. And uh, as I could show you in the case of Brazil, the capital import taxes are not going to change fundamentally what Brazil's policy choices are uh, domestically. There are a number of other cross-border issues uh, which are important. Some of them have been dealt with in the G20, but most have not. Uh, most have to do with taxation, with corruption, with illegal flows. Uh, and some of them are in the ambit of the OECD, some are in the ambit of the, uh, this is the UN Convention Against Corruption, some are in the remit of the Financial Stability uh, Board, which has been uh, formed. So these cross-border issues require multilateral approaches. It's not clear that we have the instruments that are ready to deal with these problems. And then we have the big issues, big issues like climate change, big issues like migration. Uh, for which we do not have any international or internationally acceptable uh, solutions uh, on the table. What I'm trying to portray is a system that is fundamentally changing with a lot of new challenges and threats and contrasting that with what institutions do we have and what instruments do we have to deal with uh, these, these multilateral challenges. So, one institution that we have is the IMF. The IMF ha has been entrusted with a, a whole host of new responsibilities, including uh, surveillance of imbalances, exchange rates, uh, cross-border risk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at what's coming out of the G20, the IMF has been asked to do a lot of things. Um, Secretariat for the Mutual Assessment Process, shouldn't be program. Uh, doing financial stability assessment um, FSAPs for countries who didn't request it. Okay, so now the FSAPs are going to be done for the major financial uh, market economies, including the U.S. and China and others. Um, all of the surveillance is good. The question is, what is the enforcement mechanism? And so far, we haven't seen uh, that there's much in the way of uh, uh, enforcement coming out of the, um, uh, the IMF. Of course, one of the big issues now has to do with the leadership of the IMF. And um, I'd be happy in the question and answer to get to that. Um, so I think what needs doing multilaterally uh, is that we need some sort of a much stronger recommitment to the trade regime, perhaps getting beyond uh, Doha. Um, maybe we are, we are pressing on the, or pushing on a string, as they say. Uh, maybe we've hit diminishing or negative returns on Doha, but we need some other mechanism to deal with uh, what will be, I think, increasingly contentious areas where countries are going to be using their national uh, policies um, and at the risk of international policies. There's a new book that came out by Danny Roderick on the paradox of um, democracy and growth in which he talks about his version of the impossible trinity. Nor normally the impossible trinity refers to um, monetary policy, exchange rates, and etc. But he talks about it in terms of democracy, national economic policy and global economic policy. And he makes an argument that you can have two out of those three, but you can't have all three. You can't have democracy, national policy, and uh, international policy uh, at the same time. We'll have to see whether or not that's true. But there's definitely the fact that there is much greater stress on, the, uh, on national governments to deliver in terms of uh, employment, in terms of income in terms of trade protection, 
And there doesn't seem to be an equally strong commitment on the multilateral side to defend against it. In the past, uh, business was a big champion for globalization. Business was a big champion for globalization because of what I said before, which is the gains to trade were there. You know, let's open up new markets. Let's create more trade. It's unlikely that we're going to see trade regain <clears throat> the momentum that it had in the 2000 to 2007 period, in part because that was a very unnatural period in global um, economic history. It was unnatural because you had tremendous uh, increases in trade, very high growth, very low interest rates, pretty low inflation, uh, and a lot of it was uh, driven by excessive liquidity. Um, but we need to see how we can get business to once again be a proponent of global globalization and multilateral solutions. If you look at public perceptions in the U.S., they use the Pew Survey as, a, as an indicator. Um, less than a decade ago, more than three-quarters of the American public thought that international trade or global globalization and free trade was a good thing, 78%. Um, uh, in the recent survey a year ago, it was down below 50% for the first time. And um, people ascribe a lot of the domestic ills in the U.S. with respect to employment and income distribution to globalization. When the reality is that, yes, there's offshoring, but a lot of job losses and a lot of income losses uh, have nothing to do with globalization. They have a lot to do with internal uh, structure. So we need business and the public sector to be much more pro-multilateralism, if you want to call it that. At the same time, uh, we have to acknowledge that some of the imbalances, particularly between U.S. and China, but elsewhere, um, are unsustainable and we have to act on them. And the question is, will the G20 be any more capable of acting on them than was the IMF, who for I'm not you know, here to defend the IMF, but for many years the IMF properly diagnosed the problem. Uh, the, there was just no enforcement uh, mechanism. And I think we also need to have a better sense of what is acceptable in terms of industrial policy. Um, I've done a lot of work over that over, over the years, and no one disputes the important role of government in trying to strategically position or strategically help position um, an economy. I mean, I think uh, even Korea today, if you look at the uh, green growth agenda and the, the uh, stimulus package uh, that was connected to green growth, in my view, that was, a, that was a very smart policy. You needed to do counter-cyclical macro, but you didn't want to just repaint bridges. Right? You wanted to do something that made strategic sense. In the case of Korea, uh, investing in green technology made sense because there's a future uh, export market out there. There are a lot of aspects of R&D that are involved. And there are certain significant externalities that government may well want to uh, help um, shoulder because they make economic sense. I would contrast that with some other aspects of industrial policy, which are less enlightened and less uh, horizontal in their nature uh, and much more protectionist. This picture just tells you that um, two things are going on uh, with respect to Doha. One is it's taking too long. Um, so the Doha round, uh, he's lasted for a decade. You know, at some point, uh, perhaps like a bad marriage, you have to call it quits. Um, this is just... Uh, compared to the other rounds, first the GATT and then later the WTO round, uh, taking much too long. And at the same time, we see a much greater increase uh, in exports and imports of services, which are essentially not being covered in the Doha round. So it's taken too long and it's getting largely irrelevant. Uh, it has a symbolic importance, um, but if it can't be salvaged, then we need a new uh, initiative on trade. Now, who's able to deal with the multilateral problems that we face? Well, we have the G7, 
their meeting, I guess, in a couple of days. Um, the problem is that a number of the countries are confronted with bad policy choices having to do with low growth and high debt. Uh, Europe is seemingly consumed with its internal issues, uh, but also has some demographic concerns um, which make it less um, able to deal on the global uh, scale with the problems. The U.S., as I mentioned, has tremendous problems with employment, with income distribution, and with indebtedness. So it has its domestic house sort of full. And Japan, even before the unfortunate uh, recent crisis there, um, has been in a low growth trap for 15 years um, with very high internal indebtedness and demographics that essentially doom uh, Japan to continue its low growth uh, outlook. Most Japanese economists uh, come to the same conclusion. Um, so I think nothing short of a tremendous cultural shift and, and importation of people uh, uh, can really save uh, Japan. Um, and there's some, some parallels that Korea may want to take note of because some of the demographic transition uh, factors that have really stymied Japan's growth are beginning to show uh, in Korea. So, just to be provocative, I say, if you're going to look at the G7, put your money on, Japan, on uh, Canada. Um, with uh, climate change and global warming, they've got resources, they've got size, they've got good management, they survived the banking crisis well, they have a good policy on immigration. What's not to like about Canada? I hope there's someone from the Canadian Embassy here who can <laughs> take notes. The BRICS, I, I alluded to the fact that they are an interesting political grouping. The trouble is they're so different. <laughs> um, there's very little that really connects them um, other than the Goldman Sachs and now, you know, terminology of BRICS. Um, quite disparate in income levels, quite disparate in poverty. Um, when they get together, as they did last month, they try to come up with some sort of consensus statements, and the only thing they could really come up with was we don't like commodity price volatility, okay, fine. Uh, and we don't like the US dollar as the center of the international financial system, so we want the SDR. Well, SDR discussions have been going on for the last 30 plus years, and uh, they will continue to go on. Um, but when you really look at it, part of the breakdown, there are different views as to why the Doha round at the, at the end of the George W. Bush administration broke down. Some say it was the U.S. that didn't have the right negotiating authority. Others say it was India and China that got together and decided for whatever political reasons to scuttle it. Um, <clears throat> my, my view is that India, China, Brazil, and Korea uh, do have uh, a stake in trying to uh, get something going, uh, if not Doha, then some successor to Doha. Um, the challenges to the G20. Well, <clears throat> the G20, interesting grouping, um, actually 19 countries plus the EU, um, did pretty well in dealing with the stimulus uh, programs and the fact that they needed to be coordinated and confidence globally needed to be restored and they needed to do something on the financial sector. Um, I think the G20 gets pretty good marks for its actions in 2009 and 10. But we have to realize that it is still a club, a more representative club than the G7, but still a relatively uncoordinated club um, that has no implementation capacity. So as I said, it's tried to use the IMF for some of the macroeconomic implementations. And I think it could use places like the World Bank <clears throat> to bring about big changes in things like um, the climate change issue, where the amount of investing that's necessary for climate change mitigation and adaptation is huge. Uh, it's not going to happen from public resources. It's not going to happen from private resources. But, you know, you could double the capital of the World Bank and you could make 
a big dent in some of these climate change issues if the G20 uh, sought to do so. But in any event, the real verdict on the G20 has to do with implementation. Will they be effective in dealing with problems that are facing uh, them? So under the title of whether the G20 can be the savior of multilateralism, I think we're beginning to see some discussion uh, of imbalances and some indicators that might be used. I think this is one possible harbinger of how serious, uh, seriously to take the G20. Uh, there are a lot of issues that have to do with cross-border regulation. Um, I don't think too big to fail is the issue. I think really it's a question of regulatory arbitrage um, and, and information across borders. And the question is, will this Financial Stability Board be able to do it? Financial Stability Board, again, has no implementation capacity. You know, it's another club. So at the moment, we're being uh, managed globally by a bunch of um, associations. Um, and the question is, who is actually going to do the uh, analysis and implementing? The IMF is one of those institutions that could do it. <coughs> The IMF has uh, undergone a lot of reform, but it has not yet established itself in some parts of the world um, as the reliable partner. Um, and East Asia is one of those parts of the world where self-insurance still is very uh, prevalent. So I think what we need is uh, some smart supranational solutions uh, that give us better, um, better options. At the moment, however, the EU seems very inwardly focused. Uh, uh, the U.S. has political problems which uh, uh, limit what it can do. And China, in my view, has yet to step up to the plate. Um, I don't find that, uh, that they are taking the kind of um, uh, global and globally recognized positions that would be necessary to restore multilateralism. Now, to be fair to the Chinese, if you look at when countries, for example, uh, uh, enter the OECD, which is considered another club, club of the rich uh, countries, uh, it was at levels of per capita income much higher than what China has today. Um, but China is uh, anomalous. It is this precocious uh, teenager, which is the analogy I'm leaving you with. Now, Korea's role in the G20 for me to end up. I think everyone gives Korea extremely high marks for its leadership last year at the G20. Uh, it cannot fall to Korea to be responsible for the results. Um, a lot of things that happen in the G20, particularly at the summit, um, relate to politics at home and what happens the week before, the month before. And, uh, I think Bernanke's QE2 policy a month before the summit was not very helpful in trying to deal with the imbalance problems of China and gave, I think, China an easy out uh, because everyone was busy um, attacking the U.S. for flooding the world with dollars and creating capital flows that were unwanted. So um, the results were a bit elusive. Nevertheless, Korea has uh, a number of advantages uh, as a member of the G20. I think its role in green technology and the environment is strong and can be parlayed into something uh, stronger. Uh, yes, a green growth institute was formed, but not every answer to a question is to form an institution. <laughs> um, there are other uh, policy initiatives that make sense. Uh, Korea is a very good example of business and government working together, and uh, I think we're over the point where people say government is too big or too small. Or the, the question is how effective is government, and um, how well does it uh, work with business, and how well does it uh, represent the interests of the public. I think Korea is a good example for very good educational uh, outcomes and innovation-led growth. And I think Korea has a lot to teach in that respect. And in another project that I'm working on called the Growth Dialogue, we're going to try and use uh, Korea and Finland as examples of how to link education, innovation to growth. But the Achilles heel in Korea, just as an aside, is the demographics. 
and uh, I think there are things to be done there on the retirement age, on labor force participation of women, uh, on productivity and services that are important. Uh, one area that is uh, concern is uh, distribution. And um, so that picture that I gave you about U.S., uh, someone should get the similar picture for uh, Korea and find out what's happening to the distribution of income. Uh, in the U.S. case, uh, uh, blue-collar workers have been losing uh, real wages uh, for, for 15 years or more. Um, in Korea, I don't think, it's, uh, I don't think that's the case, but I, I sense, having been here now for a week, that there's a certain level of um, disquiet um, in terms of, uh, of distribution, and, um, and I think Korea could take a leadership role in that. Um, I put Korea in the category in the G20 of Canada and Australia, um, of countries that I believe punch above their weight. Um, so I'm not a big fan of boxing, but uh, the analogy in boxing is that there's some boxers, even though they weigh 130 pounds, you know, they punch above their weight. Um, I think uh, certain countries, and I believe Canada, Australia, and Korea fit this bill in the G20, deeply believe in multilateralism. They believe in it because in the case of Korea, it's helped uh, stimulate uh, growth and development. And in the case of Australia and Canada, I think ideologically, they believe in the open, free uh, trading system and they're willing to, to stick to it. So I think these are countries that essentially uh, punch above their weight. Now, what's France going to do for 2011? Well, maybe they'll put their finance minister into the IMF. Um, we'll see. Um, but... You know, France is part of the EU. The EU has uh, at least a quarter of the chairs of the G20. But uh, we have to get beyond the problems of Europe. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of issues that need to be dealt with. Um, and I won't go through all of them here, but um, financial market regulation, oil markets, the development agenda, which is essentially uh, pretty much stalled, um, except for uh, rhetoric and some of the risks identified by the IMF. These are all things that France, as the chairperson of the G20, needs to deal with. Uh, and one has to question whether or not uh, France will be able to uh, do that. Uh, or will they be dominated by their European uh, concerns? So the keys to success going forward, um, I think in the short term we need to restore confidence, deal with some of these problems that I alluded to. Uh, I think we need to uh, create more win-win outcomes. Um, I think many economies are below their potential growth rates. We need to find ways um, to uh, create outcomes that are beneficial for more and not at the expense of someone else. We have a lot of global reserves. Um, the excess uh, hoarding of reserves in some countries, I mean, you look at the case of China, um, if they have three trillion in reserves, um, we're talking about three thousand dollars per Chinese individual. Uh, three thousand is almost the per capita GNP of China, um, and these reserves are not uh, uh, earning much money. Uh, sovereign wealth funds. There's a lot of work on what they actually invest in, and many of them are extremely risk averse and deal mostly in oil and gas and a few other uh, big. Uh, corporates, they're not, these funds are not being well uh, leveraged uh, either. Um, I think we need to see some exchange rate adjustments and um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, in terms of the who's in charge, who's running the system, uh, we have all the G possibilities, right? We have the G7 slash 8, we have the article that uh, Nuro Rubini and Bremer wrote saying that we're now in a world of G0. Nobody's in charge. Um, we have some, including Fred Bergsten and Bob Zellick and others, who tried to argue for the G2. Um, I personally don't think uh, we're there. Uh, I think the differences between China and the U.S. are too major and um, 
we need to bring in the other players, that the G2 is not the solution. So I come away saying the G20 is the only game in town. And uh, we have very little choice if we believe in globalization and multilateralism, but to invest in this G20 and hope that they uh, can be effective and can find the right ways to implement some of the um, measures that need to happen. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, thank IGE for the opportunity. Thank you. I think uh, uh, I should say uh, I should appreciate very much for his uh, rather frank assessments of the current state of the affairs of the global economy as well as this uh, G20 particularly. What is good and bad and strong and weak of this uh, G20, what the G20 will be able to do in the future. But we have no option but to, to push for the G20. But he elegantly summarized all these difficult issues, but there are still many untold stories, or you may have questions. So uh, let me call from the floor now. Uh, for any uh, questions or comments, what uh, uh, Danny Leipzig could help. Please you raise your hand if you have any and identify yourself, but limit your question in one or two minutes at the most. For well, your elegant presentation of uh, all these uh, interesting and very important issues, and I was struck by your indication on uh, Korea's role in yeah. the uh, list of uh, with the recommendations. And I would like to focus on one question. You uh, <coughs> mentioned in passing uh, the IMF report. Uh, a lot of proposals have been uh, made to reshape the international monetary system, which hasn't been functionally uh, been properly functioning. So the question is, um, there's an argument that uh, the exchange rate fluctuations in response to international shocks is a lot better than the adjustments than uh, consumptions or in terms of the growth changes in many individual countries. So uh, I would like to hear your opinion or comment. Well, <clears throat> on the exchange rate fluctuations, I mean, I, I I think that uh, <clears throat> the current system of uh, allowing exchange rates to float is, is the right system. <clears throat> I thought what you were going to say was that system reform normally refers to the fact that you know, the dollar shouldn't be the dominant uh, currency. Um, and I think the, the actions of the Fed recently, which were taken because in the U.S. there were no other instruments available. Fiscal policy sort of not done the job. Um, and I think the Fed felt it was the only, it was the only game in town um, and it, 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 it used to the maximum its capacity. The trouble was there's, there are some externalities having to do with a lot of money creation in the U.S. and I think that's what people were concerned about in terms of exchange rate uh, uh, movement. Um, that said, uh, I'm not a great fan. I, I, I'm a, uh, let me rephrase that. <clears throat> I, when uh, Chile put controls on, on short-term capital, I was one of the few that was in favor of that. Uh, <coughs> the U.S. Treasury was not, the IMF was not. Because I felt that uh, a small country like Chile that was very open uh, could defend itself better if it were not subjected to essentially hot money. Um, and I think the case in Brazil is that they have very high interest rates for other reasons. So I'm a, f a fan of letting exchange rates find their equilibrium, uh, but I also think that, in, that, that countries can legitimately defend themselves against short term. <clears throat> largely speculative uh, capital flows. So I would draw the line there. I think the IMF has made a major shift, perhaps an over-adjustment, uh, to being sympathetic to these capital taxes. I would limit it to um, flows of less than a year. <clears throat>
Thank you very much for your very comprehensive analysis. Uh, well, I agree with your point that we need to avoid both the G0 and the G2 framework. And actually, we really, need, we really need to trust on the G20 framework. But nevertheless, you said the you know, implementation is still a big issue, and uh, I don't know how long, you know, how much we can trust on. Uh, let me ask you know, two questions. First, uh, you, know, you indicated that this actually Doha round is that is doomed, and uh, uh, G20 leaders uh, provided mandate for trade ministers to come up with the conclusion of Doha round, uh, I believe, by the end of the you know, next year or something like that. So, in your view, but that mandate uh, just couldn't be implemented. Uh, but nevertheless, you mentioned that we should look for you know, G, uh, beyond the Doha round. So can you clarify you know, what we're talking about the beyond the Doha round? The basic issue is that the, how we deal with agricultural subsidy and you know, NAMA issues, right? And the, when you mentioned that beyond the, the uh, Doha round, uh, that means uh, we still need to rest down the agricultural subsidy and uh, NAMA and issues, the most critical stumbling block to conclude the uh, Doha round. And second question, <clears throat> I think the G20, you know, our leaders address that we should search for a <clears throat> balanced and the sustainable framework for global growth. And here, you know, imbalance issue, the most important one, and uh, they agree that to come up with them imbalance index uh, to denote uh, uh, which country is responsible to what extent you know, trade imbalance up or down. But apparently last finance minister's meeting, I believe they, they failed to come up with specific measures on this uh, you know, imbalance index. So I'm afraid that even uh, G20 meeting in France, uh, we may not be able to come up with specific measurement on this uh, imbalance issue. If that is true, maybe global imbalances, especially between U.S. and China, may be you know, dragging on. And, uh, so in this regard, uh, a, a current swap between uh, U.S. and China, especially the speed and uh, uh, also you know, a scale of this yuan, the, the appreciation is the big issue. So how you see the China is going to follow up I mean, you know, U.S. demand to make some rather significant adjustment of the U.N. appreciation, or China may continue, you know, the way as they have done the gradual adjustment. So how, how you see this? So depending upon this U.N. Uh, uh, you know, adjustment, maybe the bilateral, basically, you know, trade imbalance between China and the U.S. may persist. Okay, this might be hanging on. G20 in that cannot be effective. Thank you. Well, on the, uh, on the Doha, um, I think there are some existing issues that need to be dealt with. But I think the, the, the trouble with where we are now on Doha is that there are not enough benefits, tangible benefits, to completing the round. Um, you're down to sort of the nasty, nitty-gritty issues that nobody really wants to deal with. Um, so I don't have the full solution. There's a paper that just came out of Brookings by a, a guy named Joshua Meltzer where he argues that the uh, Doha or that the WTO should be turned into this adjudication uh, mechanism uh, because, you know, a lot of a lot of the issues coming up are going to be uh, in, in that category. Um, so I, I think somehow one wants to reestablish the rules without only saying that the completion of Doha is the solution because I'm very pessimistic on the completion of Doha. I mean, any, I'm not a trade negotiator, but if one goes to these meetings um, and one sees the the block of the least developed, and one sees, you know, the the, the, the narrowness of the issue. Um, I think ten years is long enough, you know, and uh, we spent ten years and haven't gotten very far. 
In the meantime, uh, most of the new trade is either under FTAs or uh, under a different arrangement. So it's becoming largely an irrelevant um, forum except for, for the symbolism. The symbolism. So uh, what I'm trying to suggest is we need something else symbolically to, to show that the G20 are still committed to uh, fair and open trade uh, uh, without saying that Doha is the only solution because I'm, I'm not convinced that we're going to get very far. Um, on the imbalances, I think you're right, uh, uh, Professor Ahn. I think you know Barry Eichengreen and others have all have have made the point that China and the U.S. are going to have these large imbalances, right? Uh, one way for these imbalances to be reduced is for the exchange rate to find a more natural uh, uh, level. Um, so, you know, whether it's because of international pressure or whether it's because of inflation in China, uh, an appreciation of the exchange rate could be seen as a positive uh, long-run uh, step. I see a disconnect between the central bank governor of China, who is, a, I wouldn't say a friend, but uh, certainly a colleague on the Growth Commission, uh, arguing that you know, the dollar shouldn't be the center of the financial system um, at the same time as the Chinese currency is, is being uh, um, managed uh, very actively. So I think there's a bit of a disconnect there. Well, uh, regarding the Doha round, uh, many uh, thought uh, it is that, but uh, recently there is uh, some changes going on there. Uh, last week, uh, Newsweek, a uh, new economist uh -huh. uh, magazine reported that, uh, that the title of the uh, article was Dead Man Talking. Dead Man Talking. Uh, so, uh, well, it has been uh, going on for 10 years, and uh, uh, the last major stumbling block was agriculture. Uh, the, uh, the, in, the many developing countries were worrying, worried about uh, agricultural inputs, particularly from the U.S. and elsewhere, from the EU, subsidized agricultural problem. But, but recently, India and many other developing nations are taking a little bit soft stance on that issue. So the uh, major issue is becoming changing to tariff. Uh, the main problem is that uh, uh, on tariff, uh, the advanced economies uh, do not have enough, uh, enough gifts to give because their tariffs are already too low. So uh, there should be some other compensation mechanism they should develop to, to uh, please these developing countries which are asked to have a large tax cuts and so on. So it's not absolutely that. It is still a lobby. It is moving. And uh, uh, we'll see what's uh, going on by the end of this year because uh, uh, this G20 is pushes, pushes a little bit hard to complete it uh, by, by this, uh, this, the end of this year. So we'll, we'll still should see. No, I think you're right. I I, uh, I appreciate uh, what you've said. The the um, the bottom line, however, is that in terms of what the advanced economies can give, um, the the difficulty is that uh, some of those advanced economies are in a far weaker economic position now than they have been during the ten years that Doha wasn't uh, completed. Um, so I think since, uh, 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 particularly in the U.S., a lot of the uh, concern now is on, on jobs, yeah. um, I, I think it's going to be rather difficult uh, to imagine uh, great concessions um, on, on that side. But, but, I mean, I hope you're right that, that uh, they, they can't find um, some common ground. I thank you very much for your excellent lecture. And I enjoyed it, and your lecture is always rewarding. I hope that you accept my question, uh, which is a bit one foot uh, uh, aside from uh, today's uh, main topic. 
Uh, these days, I feel very, very curious about the uh, EU countries. If EU countries can remain under one umbrella as they, and if these EU countries can continue to use the currency of euro, that um, uh, Pol uh, Portugal and uh, uh, Greece, these kind of countries, uh, these days the credit default swap rates are unsustainably very high. And uh, there uh, constantly is talk, uh, talks about uh, they may need restructuring of the country debts, and if uh, if, if uh, they may have to uh, forego or waive the interest and principle of uh, the country's borrowings, etc., then uh, uh, from the perspective of Germans and French, uh, they have no reason to pay. They may complain that why they have. Uh, use their taxes for su such countries and even long term this, uh, these countries uh, do not seem to have say uh, competitiveness, labor productivity to, um, to remain competitive in, within EU countries but what is your view if uh, these countries can remain uh, under the umbrella of EU thank you I'm extremely happy that I no longer work at the World Bank because uh, I can say, uh, you know, professors can say anything they like. Um, so I put myself in the shoes of the Greek uh, government uh, and I, I, I encourage each, each of you to think along the same lines. If you're now in the Ministry of Finance of Greece, okay, what, what do you really think? Um, I think that Leaving the Eurozone is a very large uh, step, leaving the Euro, although there are countries that are in the EU that don't accept, that haven't accepted the common currency. Um, so that is the absolute end game, and I think the problem with that is that uh, Greece, like Argentina and other countries, doesn't have a good track record of managing its own monetary policy. Um, so I would try to avoid that. But one step short of that is a debt restructuring, the way you describe it. And, uh, you know, I understand that some of the debt is held by German banks, uh, which could be uncomfortable for them. Um, but the only way to get Greek growth restarted and be competitive, given that the exchange rate is off the table, in my view, is really a radical restructuring of the debt. Um, and, you know, even the soft restructuring that they're talking about, I mean, this is, it's classic uh, IMF kind of uh, problem, which is, you know, you're de delaying the inevitable. You know, you're going to spend a lot of money, you know, getting to the point where you eventually have to get at it anyway which is you need some equivalent of Brady Bonds or something like that, which says, okay, everybody messed up, Greeks did poorly, the EU didn't exercise any fiscal oversight, it was their fault too, now we're going to cut the debt in half. You know? And, and yes, people take a short-term uh, you know, haircut and there are some losses to be borne, but at the end of the day, Greek has a, Greece has the potential for restarting some growth, paying the rest of the debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Without that, I don't see that they have uh, any chance of getting out of their problem. And if they have no chance, the EU and the IMF will be spending a lot of money uh, so that in 2013 or 2014, they face the inevitability of having to restructure the debt. Um, I think, since no one's asked the question, I think there's an interesting question about the role of the IMF in all this and whether or not you need a, a European head of the IMF to, uh, to understand the problems of Europe. I think you can make the opposite case. You can make the opposite case that you shouldn't treat uh, Greece any differently than you would have treated uh, Brazil or Mexico or Indonesia or anybody else uh, and that actually being a non-European is an advantage. <laughs>
uh, when it comes to managing IMF resources. But so the 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 point that I would uh, stress is that um, unless they restructure the debt, there is no really good sustainable outcome for Greece, and so they're delaying the inevitable. Um, and I would I would restructure the debt. Well, uh, you you told me that uh, you're gonna you're gonna send, say something about the Stroskan. <laughs> I didn't say I would say something about stress con, but I, I did I did uh, I did indicate that if we're using the IMF as one of the main implementers for the G20, right, then the leadership of the IMF becomes extremely important. Um, and um, I do believe that the leadership of the IMF has to take this global multilateral objective firmly in mind um, and not just the concerns of one region of the world. Okay. Um, having said uh, that, I think Christine Lagarde is a great minister Mr. of finance. <laughs> well, uh, welcome to Korea. Uh, 아주 좋은 때 라이프지 교수께서 오셨다고 아주 환영합니다. 이 지금 여러 가지 문제가 많이 있는데 어떻게 해결하면 되는가 그것은 본인이 IMF 총재를 이번에 하시던가 <웃음> 아니면 아주 라이프지 교, 교, 교수님의 뜻을 누구보다도 잘 아는 분이 상, 상홍일 <웃음> 에, 회장이라고 보는데 그분을 총재로 모시는 게 어떤가 거기에 대해서 어떻게 생각하십니까? <웃음> Uh, well, I'm uh, delighted to be put into that category, but um, I think uh, Dr. Sagong is much more qualified, of course. Um, so there was a, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the day before, I received an email from uh, a think tank in Washington that was doing a survey of who should be the IMF uh, leader, and they had 15 names. Um, and uh, Sagong Il was one of those uh, 15 names. Um, so there's no doubt that there uh, are a number of people who are uh, qualified. And, and uh, so, so, you know, there's no doubt about that. Um, there's been a lot of talk prior to this, uh, the Strauss-Kahn resignation, that uh, the leadership of the international financial institutions uh, should not be reserved for an American at the World Bank and a European at the, um, at the IMF. Um, and many countries inside the G20 have stated their general appreciation for that. Um, for those of us, I used to work in the U.S. government and then in the World Bank. For many people like you, uh, I always took those general pronouncements with a, as we say, a grain of salt, which is, yeah, let's see when it comes to the, when it really comes to the, uh, to the point. Um, I, I, it's never been clear to me that the Europeans deeply were willing to give up the IMF uh, chair, and it's not clear to me that the Americans are deeply committed to giving up, or willing to give up the, IM, the World Bank uh, chair. Having said that, um, the forces that will determine nation, you know, where the person will come from um, are a little bit odd this time because had the presidency of the IMF come up in a more natural way with more time to think about it. Um, I think the emerging e market economies, for example, could have coalesced around one or two candidates. Uh, but because it happened so abruptly, you now have 10 candidates, or in the case of the survey that I was asked to fill out, 15. <clears throat> so like in any voting uh, pattern, you know, this plays to the hands of the establishment, established power structure because the emerging markets haven't had a chance to say, well, we have, this is our best candidate from Asia and this is our best candidate from Latin America and let the Europeans put up their best candidate and then we'll have three. Okay, now let's pick. Should it be Sagong? Should it be Augustine Karstens? Should it be Christine Lagarde? Whatever. Um, and then there could have been more trading and discussion. Maybe it will still happen, you know. It's, I don't think they're going to decide tomorrow 
but um, uh, m my general point is that um, it's come up in a very unusual way. And that um, reinforces, I think, um, the forces that are in favor of a status quo. Having said that, everyone always says you should be blind to the nationality and look for the quality of the person, okay? I think to be fair to the French minister, she is definitely qualified. You know, she deserves to be on the list. Um, what's unfortunate is when certain world leaders say, at this important time for Europe, we definitely need a European, right? That, I think, is uh, A, not very much in the spirit uh, of the G20 and multilateralism and all the statements that have been made by heads of government. Um, and it may actually be wrong. You might actually want the Minister of Finance of Singapore or the Minister, former Minister of Korea dealing with the European problem because you may want some distance uh, from, from, the, uh, from the reality. Okay. Uh, Professor Daniel Lafitiger is an uh, I appreciate your prominent presentation this morning. I have two kind of questions about the prediction. What is your prediction to the future of Europe, including the, you know, this time the heavily as the, the faced the financial crisis in South European countries? What is the prediction? They can easily just overcome that kind of difficulties in the near future or not. For example, I uh, try to explain the, our experience during the our financial crisis from 1998 to three years, and then completely we repaid the old money from uh, the IF. So we left the successful story and the IMF history. We overcome completely from the financial crisis. During that time, even though the, we had a very severe liquidity problems, but we had we had very potentiality in our manufacturing industries, as you know well. Yes, well, five or six of the very old class competitive industries already we had. So we could recover the kind of difficulties. But how do you think about that? Now, the current the European financial crisis, can they, with the kind of a heavy as their social safety nets and many kind of as burdens? And the second one is what is your perception about the IMF governance? During that hour as a financial crisis, the IMF pressed to our government to implement the very severe policies First of all, the raise the interest rate. We are suffering from the kind of 32% annual interest rate. And then on exchange rate from 801 to one dollars to 2001 to one US dollars. And the other one, restructuring many kinds of civil policies. Okay. So we could recover. But this times already IMF decided to lend a huge amount of money to these countries. What their civil policies or any other kinds under any conditions to those countries? Okay. I don't know. Okay. But these times, the European candidate to govern the IMF, another, during the times, uh, Gandish, maybe, these times, uh, BSK, a uh, Khan. Okay. Who will be elected the next to government's top government? I think the difference between Korea and uh, Greece, let's say, is uh, Korea was a liquidity problem and uh, Greece is basically a solvency problem. Um, so I think uh, they, they, they need to restructure. Um, some of the other countries, it's a little bit up in the air. But as you say, if the Europeans are deeply committed to their safety nets, then you're not going to get the wage adjustment that would be necessary and the exchange rate is off the, the, the table. So um, that would be my answer. On the IMF, I mean, uh, you know, I was here in 97 and, uh, and uh, if you read Joe Stiglitz's first book, uh, he's very critical of the IMF about their interest rate <laughs> policy and, and we all knew that with interest rates at 25%, every chaebol in Korea is bankrupt. And uh, so the IMF, I think, uh, 
messed, you know, they, they gave the wrong policy prescription. Uh, they, they have suffered in, this, in the sense that nobody in East Asia wants to deal with the IMF. Um, I think the real question you're asking is, was the IMF too soft um, on Europe? And um, I think maybe. But the, the, the problem is that you don't have the exchange rate as a tool. You don't have monetary policy as a tool. And so what can the IMF say? Fix your fiscal. Yes. Um, but it's very hard to do when, you, when you're not growing. What uh, you can say about the Korea-US FTA ratification at the House uh, in Washington? I think it's in the capable hands of Dr. Han Duk Su. <laughs> 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 um, I, I don't know. I think the, the, the problem in the U.S. is obviously that uh, people mistakenly associate uh, FTAs with uh, job losses, whereas I believe that actually in the case of Korea, that's not the case. Um, but I don't think I have a good uh, uh, prediction. Oh. But uh, I used to uh, ask questions. Anyway, um, uh, Dr. Sawagil uh, played the role of uh, coordinator for the G20 uh, summit, uh, and uh, he, uh, he said that uh, Korea is a host country of G20 uh, uh, summit conference. Uh, Korea achieved a lot of things, but you, uh, you said the results are elusive, so I'd like to ask you, I'd like you to uh, elaborate on that. What are the things that Korea achieved, and what are the things that Korea didn't fail to achieve? And the second one is, I, I, as far as I know, uh, America is the originating a place where uh, uh, globalism or neoliberalism uh, uh, started. So, uh, so it is quite interesting that Americans' uh, attitude toward globalization uh, has become negative. So uh, is it time uh, for policymakers to uh, promote or publicize the uh, good things of the uh, globalization? I think those are two good questions. On the second one, I think uh, you're quite right that the, the U.S. And, and others were uh, the custodians, in a way, of, of the open trading system. And, uh, and neither Korea nor China nor others uh, would have done as well um, had the system not been, uh, you know, um, fairly open. Okay, there are always going to be areas of... of uh, uh, so the, the fact that the public is now viewing globalization as a bad thing uh, does not speak well for uh, the press in our country, uh, which, you know, is... Think about Fox News, you know, they don't exactly tell you the truth. Um, uh, it, and it's very unfortunate that um, politicians and others have associated globalization with all the economic ills in the U.S. You know, what's happening to uh, jobs in, in various parts of the country is all, we, you know, ascribed to offshoring and, and outsourcing uh, rather than poor education or lack of infrastructure or um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it's, it's indeed unfortunate that that sentiment has shifted. On the verdict on G20, um, I don't uh, intend to contradict uh, Dr. Sagong, particularly not when I'm at the IGE. <laughs> um, uh, what I was referring to was the fact that on some of the, the big ticket items, like the question of Chinese exchange rates and uh, imbalances, um, the G20 summit in November was not able to make progress on those. In part, I ascribe it to uh, the, the Fed policy shift the month before the summit, which I think was tactically, I mean, yes, the Fed is independent, but unfortunately, the timing could not have been worse uh, for the G20. I think Korea did a, uh, uh, an excellent job in the preparation for the G20. Um, the development agenda and on the financial stability uh, front. Um, but those are things that we still have to see how they will come out, right? I mean, it's one thing to have a pronouncement. It's another then to say, okay, uh, how, how's the Financial Stability Board going to act and how's the development agenda mm -hmm. going to be put forward? Yeah. Um, I think the tangible thing that people were looking for or some people were looking for was to have uh, a firmer action on the uh, exchange rates 
issue for China. And unfortunately, that eluded the summit. And it was not the fault of the uh, preparation. Uh, it was just exogenous things happen, you know. And if things happen a week before the presidents of the world get together, you may lose that opportunity. And I think they lost an opportunity on the exchange rate. Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Chinese inflation rate is about one eighth, one eighth of the capital inflow uh, rate uh, of, of the country. Um, if uh, if uh, Chinese inflation rate goes up, uh, because uh, China, China and because China is still the uh, international factory and also we already spoiled with by the low prices, are we ready to deal with it? Are we, are we ready to deal with the increase of all the product? Um, on, on your question, I think there are, there are always other cheaper sources. Um, so I don't think that we're going to see, you know, rampant global inflation because of uh, supply chains that, you know, originate in China. I think when you talk about the oil market or certain commodities, it's got a much more direct effect. I think there's, given a certain amount of time, there's definitely substitution available uh, uh, if Chinese pr prices, quote, wages end up being too high. But I think China has a lot of instruments like most countries. The exchange rate is only one. Uh, you know, there are other ways to maintain competitiveness, and I'm sure the Chinese will use those ways. So I'm, I don't have a big worry that, that your question implies. Okay, I, I wish we could go on all this morning, but uh, yes, uh, already time is uh, overdue, uh, and uh, he has to leave pretty soon. So uh, let me close this morning session here, and thanks again for all the audience, and uh, thanks again, Thank Dr. Danny Leipziger, for giving us another nice lecture this time, and we hope we can see you again next time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.